What's the word, y'all? DeJounte Murray is an Atlanta Hawk. Oh, boy. Um, I'm already knowing that this is about to be one of the more polarizing trades of the year from your favorite content creators, from your favorite podcasters to writers. It's going to be all over the place, and it should. I can understand the argument for it being a bad trade for the Atlanta. Okay, bad is a stretch. I don't think there's going to be a ton of people saying it's a bad trade, but maybe the timing of it is a bit weird um, versus, oh, this is a W trade. I can see it from pe people saying at the Spurs. What the heck are you doing to I understand? And I'm here to talk about everything, ladies and gentlemen. Be sure to leave a like, subscribe if you're new. Let me know what you think about this trade because at the end of the day, I'm just a guy with a microphone with some opinions and some of them end up being bad, especially when y'all be tweeting at me clips from three years ago. Bro, it was three years ago. I was wrong. I accept those things, but you ain't got to shove it in my face. All right, so we knew that these teams were talking, right? Over the last three or so days, we knew that the Atlanta Hawks were very interested in DeJounte Murray. Um, even before the trade was finalized, we found out that the Knicks were interested. We found out that the Minnesota Timberwolves are interested, and that's what made me super interested. And though I do love the idea of seeing Trey Young and DeJounte play together, I thought the idea of Anthony Edwards, Carl Anthony Towns, DeJounte, it was like, you know what I'm saying? They obviously didn't want to give up the same equity, uh, pick equity that the Atlanta Hawks gave up. And if you added a loop, let me fill you in. So it started off with Wolves just saying that Gallinari and multiple first round picks are going for DeJounte Murray. And I got the world thinking, how many first round picks? What are the protections on these first round picks? The Spurs had told the world, basically, we're not looking for John Collins. We're not looking for DeAndre, DeAndre Hunter, Kevin Herter. We don't even want A.J. Griffin. We don't want anybody that could come in and help us play basketball. And we're going to talk about the reasons for that in a second. They wanted dead salary and hella picks. And the Atlanta Hawks obliged. They gave them exactly what they wanted. The Hawks sent three first round picks in a future pick swap to pair DeJounte Murray with Trey Young. A 2023 first round pick via Charlotte, its own 2025 and its own 2027 pick. And then later we found out that the protections on those last two picks are none. Um, We're in 2022, ladies and gentlemen. You don't get a ton of trades that happen that incorporate unprotected picks. It doesn't happen often. And the Atlanta Hawks, Travis Slank and them, they like, hey, we believe DeJounte and Trey Young is our backcourt of the now and also backcourt of the future, considering that DeJounte Murray is only 25 years old. And we're willing to pay seven years worth of, okay, okay, no, the, we're in 2022. So basically five years worth of picks because we believe in this pair so much. And you got to remember where they're coming from, right? They were just in the conference finals two years ago and they gave out that offseason like $300 million in salary. They believe that Pretty much everything that worked out for them that the conference finals run, we're going to run it back. And obviously, it was a disappointment. For the majority of the season, they were sitting below like the 11th seed. They turned up in the, the last quarter of the year, and they found themselves winning the play-in and being in the playoffs. But y'all know how that worked out. And now you have a team. Now you got dogs barking. W one second. You got a team to overachieve to the max um, the previous year and then underachieve. You know, the hype was super real. You know, I remember on our podcast, we were trying to predict the NBA standings before the season started, and majority of us had them as like one of the top five seeds in the Eastern Conference. Um, I did it. I made a bet that the Bulls are going to have a better record, and we did. It didn't matter, but I won about 100 bucks, so I'll take that. Either way, Travis Lank and company realized that this core, this, this group has a ceiling, and they reached that. I mean, and, and we're still trying to figure out what's going on with John Collins. I'm sure he'll probably get moved as well, but they went to buy in because DeJounte Murray was an all-star player. He has all defensive capabilities. He's done it in previous years. And, well, they think that this backcourt is going to be nice. And I understand it from a pure talent standpoint, but now we're about to ask Trey Young to do something that we've never seen Trey Young have to do on any level. Other than, like, I guess he talks about early high school, he was a shooting guard, and yada, yada, yada. Because we, we go to college, he's the guy, obviously. That's how you end up getting drafted, where you get drafted. And then he was given the keys to the Atlanta, Haw Atlanta Hawks from the very, very early on. And Trey Young and himself, just like how I say this about Rudy Gobert and Rudy Gobert himself is a top five defense, Trey Young is a top five offense as the guy. But it always feels like, or at least so far in his career, and it's only been basically two years of them trying to be competitive, there was a ceiling on top of that where you wanted more from all the others. You wanted the team to be better defensively. And now we're asking Trey Young, the ball is not in your hands 100% of the time. Not 100% of the time. We have another dude in DeJounte Murray 
who's basically just grown accustomed to being the number one ball handler too. Like he was basically number two when DeMar DeRozan was there. He played that really solidly. But when DeMar DeRozan left to go to Chicago, this is the year that he blossomed into an all-star completely. And he was as ball dominant as a lot of people in the NBA. With DeMar DeRozan, DeJounte Murray had a, a 23.5 usage rate, which is not very high. Well, it's pretty good, but it's not very high. And then he jumped up to 27, which is actually lower than I anticipated it to be. And then if you compare that to Trey Young, though, Trey Young had a 34.4% uses rate, which is one of the highest in all of basketball. And I went through this whole spiel yesterday, um, and, and it was geared towards younger players. I think the catalyst of it was me talking about Anthony Simons, and now he has to move a little bit better off the ball now that Dame is going to be there full time. Um, and the same thing happens with Trey Young. We've never seen Trey Young move without the ball, ever, ever. And now if DeJounte Murray and you are sharing these, these ball handler abilities, you need to because DeJounte hasn't showed the world just yet that he is a, a reliable catch-and-shoot shooter. This season, no catch-and-shoot threes. He shot 34.5%, which is slightly below average on two-and-a-half attempts. So I'm just super curious at how these two actually play out, and that's why I was so excited for it because I like to see like unconventional or people that might not look great on paper go together. And, and, and a lot of the times, if you have talented people like DeJounte Murray and Trey Young, they'll usually figure it out. It might not happen the first week or month of the season, but they'll learn how to play together a little bit more. And, and part of that is getting Trey Young to accept and, and be better off the ball. And I don't think you do a deal like this without talking to Trey and, and Trey understanding that DeJounte is not coming here to be the Kevin Herter replacement as far as like, I'm going to catch a shoot and occasionally create for myself. No, DeJounte is going to get a ton of ball handling uh, uh, possessions with this team now. I like this more from the defensive side of the ball, obviously. We know Trey Young is one of the worst defenders in all of basketball. Part of that is just individual effort and part of that is his physical cap uh, limitations with DeJounte Murray on his team. I I'm just going to assume that we're going to get a better defensive version of Trey Young. And again, I'm not, <laughs> listen, I'm not saying that he's about to be out there locking people up, but I think that the effort level on Trey Young's defense is going to be higher. What does that get him? I don't really know. Again, he's, he's like a six foot point guard. You know what I'm saying? Those guys typically don't become good defenders, but he, he basically been a guy that stands around and doesn't do anything. And DeJounte Murray hopefully gets the best out of him now that DeJounte Murray is an all-defensive level guy. You know, hold him accountable. At least you would want him to. And now that Trey Young is not the, the highest usage player in all of basketball anymore, maybe he got a little bit more energy to at least try defensively. But it's hard for me to, to grade this trade as of right now because it, it, from every report I saw from The Athletic, the John Collins slash Atlanta Hawks relationship is gone to the point of no return. So it seems like he's going to be moved on to his next team. So I can't even look at like the potential lineups because I don't know what the return of John Collins is. I was listening to Zach Lowe's podcast a couple days ago and he was saying that a lot of people are going to be surprised because they, they believe that the Trey Young, I mean not the Trey Young, the John Collins return is not going to be as high as a lot of people expect. So that could be, is that Harrison Ball? Like, I don't know what it's going to be just yet, but I have to wait to see exactly what that is before I start throwing out the grades. I am, though, very, very surprised, I guess is the word I want to use here, that they gave up this much pick equity with little to no, or actually literally no protections on top of it. Again, it doesn't happen in the game of basketball. Not anymore. We, we've seen some horror stories of giving up three first-round picks unprotected. That turns into Jalen Brown and who else, who else was a part of that? Um, okay, it turned into Colin Sexton, Kyle Kuzma, and Jalen Brown. I mean, that, those are, you know what I'm saying? Those are three good NBA players, some of them better than others. Um, so we've seen teams go, and this was basically a decade ago now. We, we, have, we don't see it as often now. Um, when teams go all in and, and give up three first-round picks, et cetera, et cetera, and it turns to a horror story because this idea of this team that you believe in doesn't live up to the capabilities, and now you're out of your own picks. And, and though you want to tank and turn it all around and get the young talent in, you're ass. And now you don't even have your own picks to, to – to reap the rewards of being bad. So they have to have immense amount of, of confidence that A, Trey Young and DeJounte Murray are going to mesh perfectly, and B, that they're going to be able to re-sign DeJounte Murray in two seasons because DeJounte Murray only has this season and the next season left on his contract, and then he's unrestricted. A bro can go any way he want, you know what I'm saying? I mean, of course, depending on the market, but you have to believe or hope that that's going to work out. 
Because if DeJounte Murray and Trey Young, for some reason, over the next couple seasons, don't work the way a lot of people anticipated to work, and he goes to his next team, that 2025 first round pick, that 2027 first round pick is going to get juicy. You know, and you'll probably still have Trey Young, so it's probably not going to be the first overall pick, but it can get juicy. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's all I'm saying. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. The Atlanta Hawks had been a team that has drafted pretty pretty good over the last couple of years. So to see them just just give away those picks. Not okay, okay, they're not giving it away, Kenny. They got DeJounte Murray back in return. But you understand what I mean. A top one protection. That the, the top one protection, at least. You know what I'm saying? Top three, top five? Recent oh man. L- let me know in the comment section who exactly it was. Somebody recently traded a traded a pick. This was um I I don't know, three within the last three to five years where they protected the top one. Like, we don't care if it's two to three, but if you get the number one pick, we want to keep that one, and we, we'll turn that into something else in the future. I'm trying to figure it out, figure out exactly who it was, but I cannot remember, so whatever. All right, let's, let's look at this from the perspective, perspective of the Spurs because I've been seeing under my tweet. It's been a few hours since the trade happened, so I, I've been looking at the tweets. Um, people saying that the Spurs got finesse. What are they doing? And, and, and I'm not saying I completely agree with what they're doing, but let me break it down to you if you're, if you're wondering. DeJounte Murray is a 25-year-old guard who's good enough to, to help you stay above being the worst player in the league, but he's not good enough to put you into championship contention. Or in recent years, he hasn't even really been good enough to help you be more than like an 8 or 9 seed. We're talking about a guy who, who's on one of the best contracts in all of basketball as an all-star caliber player, but he is only under contract for a couple more seasons. Do they believe, do we believe that in these next couple years of DeJounte Murray, we're going to get to the spot where it's worth keeping him? And that's what they're thinking. There are a lot of teams out there that wait until that last season that, a, that an all-star caliber player is on his contract. And be like, we'll trade him now. And, and your reward for that is not as high as if you traded him away and he, when he's got two years left or maybe even three years left. And the Spurs tried to be proactive and traded DeJounte away when he had the most value. He has the most value. He had way more value now than he would have had la- next year at the beginning of the season, next offseason, next trade deadline. You got some extremely unprotected picks. Now, again, some of those picks might end up being the 20th overall pick. We don't really know. The Atlanta Hawks can go together and Trey Young and DeJounte are uh, fitting like a glove, and now they're a championship team, and now those picks are terrible, and you traded away an all-star player for the, the shot at a top-something pick, and you don't get that. There's risk in everything. Just like the Atlanta Hawks put up a risk that that trade might bite them in the butt in 2027, the Spurs are putting together the risk that those picks don't mean nothing. Either way, I understand it. I completely understand that the Spurs have been a team that refused to bottom out. For for as long as I have been an NBA fan, the Spurs have been adequate enough, well, majority of the time they've been championship contenders, but been adequate enough to be, when they aren't in the playoff team, they right outside of it. Now we got the, the 13th pick, the 12th pick. And it's hard to build a championship quality team that way. And when you're looking at a market like San Antonio, the way you build your teams and what we have seen from, from the teams that won championship with them is through the draft. And us selecting ninth overall every season, 12th overall every season, is going to be a lot harder to build that team. But if we get a top five pick, mm, it gets a little bit easier. And a lot of people are pointing out the fact that in the 2023 draft, there, there is a talent out there that I can't say this with, with confidence for myself, but a lot of people are saying that this guy is the best draft prospect since LeBron James. So if that is the case, um, I, I might take my chances because the alternative is just we good enough to be the 12th seed every single season. Oh, snap, we got the ninth overall pick. That ain't Victor Wabanyama. You know what I'm saying? And I don't want to set Spurs fans up for disappointment because more likely than not, you're not getting Victor Wabagana. There's a chance. There might be a 48% chance the way your roster looking, but the, the chances are still extremely slim. But I like though that 14% chance a lot better than the 5% chance that I would have got if I was a, a lottery team, but not one of the worst teams in basketball. Like there's a reason why they didn't want AJ Griffin or John Collins or even Kevin Herter or, or DeAndre Hunter. They want to be as bad as as possible bad as humanly possible for this upcoming draft at least that's what i'm thinking what if they go out there and do something crazy De- um deandre aiden welcome to san antonio like what are we doing that for but i, I think that's their idea i think that is what I, their idea we're gonna take all of these these draft picks we're just gonna stash them away we got josh primo i think they said lonnie walker gonna walk um we still got keldon johnson these are guys that are 22 and younger 
that if we do get one of the top three picks next season, whether it be Victor Guabanyama or Scoot Henderson or whoever the third best prospect is going into this season, we, we like our chances in this draft over we the, the chances we have of making the playoffs with DeJounte as our guy. I mean, unprotected picks, bro. Unprotected picks go a long way. But again, we have seen situations where they haven't gone anywhere. That is a chance that you take if you are the Spurs. So Spurs fans, welcome to, to what it's like to be a fan of a team that's no longer trying to win basketball games. I know for a lot of y'all Spurs fans, you've never seen this in your lifetime. Yeah, yeah, welcome. Majority of us fan bases went through years of this. I went through five years, half of a decade of us trying to be bad. And guess what? We got lucky with the fourth overall pick. We was trying to be bad. We had seven, seven, and seven. You, you need be bad enough to have the 14% chance so you don't even have the opportunity to get number seven. The lowest you could drop is four. That, that should be your mindset. The lowest we drop is four. You know? I guess in some cases it can be five. Hmm. Some cases it could be five. Either way, I understand the ideas behind this trade from both sides. That's why I don't believe this is finessed. I don't think the Spurs were finessed. There is a world where the Atlanta Hawks overpay slightly. That's all. You know what I'm saying? We got to see what the rest of the team looks like. We got to see what Trey Young DeJounte look like halfway through the season. Um, but to see DeJounte Murray in Atlanta is going to be cool. It's definitely going to be cool. Trying to think about is there any other aspects of this trade that's interesting before I get out of here. And I can't think of anything. So let me know what you think about this trade uh, down below. I'll be down there. And then tomorrow, about 24 hours as I'm recording this video, we're going to be in free agency. So things are going to get even crazier than this. We've seen one all-star player get moved. How many total all-stars, all-star caliber players do you think will be switching teams this offseason? Also answer that in the comment section. I'm excited.